Good morning. Thank you, Paulette, for that. That was wonderful. It looks like to uh, wish everybody a happy Fourth of July weekend. I'm glad everybody's here today. Uh, you know, we talked about doing something different as far as another service goes. Keeps this up. We may have to do it. We're getting. We we, we just about filled her up today, so that's a good thing. We just like to welcome everyone here. We welcome you on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, radio, wherever you might be listening today, we just welcome you for that also. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing Brother Jim today. He's had a birthday party this week uh, with a grandson. He's refreshed and ready to go. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. Remember the prior request this week. Uh, Gail and Fred's son-in-law was in the, in the hospital at Erlinger running some tests. Uh, Jared, remember him. They don't really know what's going on with him, so remember him. Brooke is in the in the fellowship hall if the children would like to go down and stay with her she has plenty of room down there if you would just like to go down there and sit with your children down there uh, that's available also next sunday morning 10 o'clock brother brett's going to have an outdoor children's service under the pavilion at the fellowship hall so if the children would like to come he's going to stage some seats around make plenty of room for that and we'll start that next sunday morning at 10 o'clock so that's what that'll look like. Brooke will still man the overflow or, or that area. If you just like to feel more comfortable with your children there, uh, then that's, that's we'll make that available. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, if you'd like to join our Facebook Live service here at the church, we welcome you. We'll just ask you to sit in the audience like you are now, and we'll have our, have our table up front here, and, and hopefully we can mingle a little bit with that, uh, see what that looks like. So we'll try that. Uh, just remember to call somebody, reach out to someone, and uh, and just just be continue to be with us in your prayers. Remember the pulpit committee; everyone's still having surgeries, uh, therapy, uh, still going through different procedures and things. Remember, remember all these. Uh, but just welcome welcome everyone here today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us, Lord. This beautiful day, the beautiful weekend you gave us, Lord. We just thank you for. For, for our freedom that we have to, to come and worship you today, Lord. We just ask you to be with our church and our country, Lord, that you'll just lead, guide, and direct us, Lord, that, that you'll just be with the leaders of our country, just the doctors and the scientists, Lord, that are coming up with, with all these things, Lord. We just ask you to give them, a, give them a vaccine, Lord, that we can just move on with our lives, Lord, and our country can move on. Lord, we just ask you to be with our church and our pulpit committee, Lord, just lead, guide, and direct us. And we just thank you for the ones that's, that's worked so hard behind the scenes, Lord, to make all these things happen that we can we can continue to have service, Lord. We just thank you for that. And, Lord, we just ask you to be the many, many prayer requests that's been spoken about this week, Lord. We just ask you to be with you. We ask all these things in your name. We give you the praise and glory for it all. Amen. Well, good morning. We are glad you're here. Uh, we're going to have a new call to worship for the month of July. The title of the song is Forever. It comes from a couple of places in Scripture. One, 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And we want to stand and sing that this morning. You'll learn it just as we will. It's the first time we've sung this also. But some of you may know it, so join in and sing with us. to the Lord our God and King His love endures forever for He is good He is above all things His love endures forever sing praise sing praise with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm his love endures forever for the life it been has been reborn his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing praise sing praise forever god is faithful forever god is strong forever god is with us forever and ever forever 
From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. praise. Forever God is faithful. for his faithfulness aren't you glad he's faithful you may be seated we're going to continue to sing we're going to sing the hymn america the beautiful we'll sing all four verses Scenes beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crowned thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining. 
We're going to sing Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. We'll sing all five verses, then we'll sing the chorus. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed his faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built him an altar in the evening news and dance. You can read the righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is shifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. Our God is marching on. He is coming like the glory of the morning on the way. He is wisdom to the mighty. He is honor to the brave. So the world shall be his footstool and the souls of wrong his slave. Our God is marching on. folks. Uh, good to see you this morning. Please take your Bibles and turn in um, the Old Testament to the book of Psalms. Psalm 85. Psalm 85. Thank you for being patient with your leadership. They really are trying to feel their way through this process. Um, uh, if you have any suggestions, I'm sure they will take your suggestions. But understand, they have been praying and thinking through about every possible angle that you can consider. But please, if you have any uh, suggestions, don't fail to uh, mention them to one of the staff or to your chairman of deacons, Tim. Uh, not to me. <laughs> no, I'll listen to them also. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, you taped off some of the, uh, the pews. I wish you had picked a different color tape. <laughs> Crimson would have been more godly, but I guess we're in orange country, aren't we? Probably, Milburn, did you pick out the tape? Okay, I, that looks like a Milburn job. All right. Have you got uh, the text? Please stand out of reverence for, for God's word. Let me read Psalm 85. Psalm 85. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord. 
and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Thank you. Would you be seated, please? Uh, as Tim said a little while ago, we did spend this last week uh, up in Kentucky. Uh, the occasion for us to be up in Kentucky was this um, Hunter, our oldest grandson's fourth birthday. Now, we've been to birthday one and birthday two and birthday three, and so we had to go to four. I've not showed you their pictures, but you're getting to see them now. Let me see what is up there. Okay, that's Hunter. Handsome. Looks a lot like Grandpa, wouldn't you reckon? I would receive a hearty amen to that. Well, go back to Hunter. Go back to Hunter. There he is. Hunter uh, got that uh, puzzle of the solar system for birthday from his aunt, uh, my daughter Elizabeth, and he put that thing together. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. All right, now go to the second. Okay, that's Jake. Now we ask him to smile. That's his smile, that's the best he can do. <laughs> and he's holding a squirt gun that he had just got through squirting Papa with. But Papa squirted him back in his own. All right, then to the next one. Thought I'd show you everybody here. Uh, you recognize Papa and Grandma. Uh, we're at a park near Frankfurt. That's my son, Ben, next to me. Um, his wife, Julie. And then, of course, Beverly is holding Jake. And then Hunter, Batman Hunter. Uh, is down below. Now, can we talk a minute, just heart to heart? When I look at these pictures, and especially the wonderful visit that we had with Ben and Julie and the boys, and then think about what's been happening in our land, I'm deeply troubled. Deeply troubled. For my grandkids and the land that they're growing up in. It was not right what happened to Mr. Floyd. It was tragedy. And the protest you could understand. But what I don't understand is the burning, the pillaging, the looting, the defacing of public and private property in some of our inner cities. I just don't understand. And then I don't understand how a mayor could order the police not to enforce the law. I don't get that. And then a move, a move to defund the police in major cities across our land. I'm sure that thrills organized crime to hear that kind of of nonsense, don't you? And uh, drug lords and gangs that already control sections of the inner cities and our major cities, and now they would be given free reign by defunding the police. When you hear this kind of stuff, as a papa looking at a four-year-old and an almost two-year-old, it troubles me deeply. And so I'm driven back to God. And I'm driven back to the Lord and say, Lord, can you give me some assurance in these troubled days? When I look at the circumstances all around, I'm troubled. I'm troubled in this land. 
And so my question has been, Lord, can you give me some assurance? Our text gives us as Christians some assurances that we can hold on to in troubled times. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, you can't hold on to these assurances in good days also. Here are some wonderful bedrock assurances that God gives to us as his people, no matter what the circumstances may be externally. Let's dig in. First assurance is this. God's focus is his people. God's target is his people people. Look, if you will, at verse 1. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. Jacob's other name is Israel. Any time, most times, you find Jacob or Israel in the Psalms, it's referring to the people of Israel. In other words, the people of God. Notice, if you will, that God showed favor to his people. You see, his focus, his eye is on his people. Look at verse 2. You forgave the iniquity of your people. Look at verse 6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you. Look at verse 8. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people. Let me say it again. God's focus is on his people. And he will take care of his people no matter what may happen in a country. He will never leave us or forsake us, and his grace will be sufficient to face whatever we face in this land as Christians. The reason for the writing of this psalm is the children of Israel have been, or the Israelites, I should say, have been in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Then God brought them back to their homeland. That's the occasion for the writing of this psalm. God's eye was on his people in Babylon, and he took care of them and prospered them, even in a foreign land, Babylon. Now he has brought them back to their homeland and is prospering them also. Note, if you will, God disciplined his people for idolatry. The discipline was stern. He sent them into captivity in Babylon for 70 years, brought them back. God's focus is his people. Sometimes he disciplines us. Sometimes he blesses us. But we are the apple of his eye. God's focus, God's target is his people. As I said earlier, these are uncertain times and I just don't know what's going to happen in the future. I just don't. It may be that we as God's people will face discipline in this country. It may be that we will experience harder days than we have experienced. It may be that there will be persecution of Christians in this country. 
it may be on the other hand that blessings will come to God's people in this country. It may be that revival will break out in this country. It may be that a great awakening will take place in this country. It may be that Jesus' return is just around the corner. I don't know what will happen in the future. I just don't. You see, I used to have a crystal ball, but I sold it before we left Northport, Alabama. So I just don't know what's going to happen. You know, not only do I not know, no one knows but God. Not the TV preacher, not the hottest prophecy book that has been written, no one knows what the future holds. But I do know this. God's target and God's focus is his people, and he will never leave us or forsake us. Jesus said he would be with us to the end of the age. Remember that in Matthew chapter 28? And his grace will be sufficient for whatever comes against the church, God's people in this age. John Crowder was a part of our church in Denver, Colorado. John served in World War II. He flew on B-24s. His job was to take pictures after bombing runs. The bombers would fly over the German uh, cities and bomb where they bombed. And then after the dust settled and the fires went out, John and his plane would come over and John would take pictures of the areas that had been bombed. Uh, I've seen some of those pictures that he still had. John said sometimes uh, the bombs would hit the target and sometimes they would not. But God never misses his target. We are his target. His eye is on us. He moves heaven and earth to accomplish his purposes for his people. Now, I don't know what those purposes are exactly. I just don't. I know he's preparing us for eternal assignments that he has for his bride in glory and this world is preparatory, but I don't know the machinations of all of that. I don't know how it will all work out. All I know is this. His eye is on the target. That's us. And he'll take care of us no matter what happens in this country. Second assurance is this. God's people have been saved. We see that in verses 2 and 3, and we're on our way to heaven. This life is transitory. We're here for just a brief while. This is not home. Heaven is home. Look, if you will, at verses 2 and 3. Well, verse 1, 2. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Now think with me, a very important concept that you need to have in uh, doing hermeneutics and doing understanding of uh, the Bible, the physical things that the Old Testament gives to us are really pictures of spiritual truths that we find in the New Testament. What you find in Psalm 85 is Israel returning to the land. In other words, they were in captivity in a foreign land, Babylon. God brought them home. That's a picture that one day we'll be released from our captivity here, and one day we'll go home. 
God turned away from his fierce anger of their idolatry in verses um, 2 and 3. Uh, verse 3, fierce anger. Another version translates it hot anger. The same is true for us. The Lord poured out on Jesus his hot anger, his fierce anger, his wrath for all of our sins on Jesus on the cross. Redemption was accomplished for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. And any time anyone becomes a follower of Jesus, then that redemption that was accomplished is applied to our hearts and we are pronounced forgiven of all of our sin. God's hot anger, his fierce anger for our sins was poured out on Jesus. Notice, if you will, it says in verse 2 that their sins were covered. That's the Old Testament way of thinking about the forgiveness of sins. Their sin was covered. But in Jesus now, our sin is not covered. It is washed away. It's all gone. All gone. All God. And we are pronounced forgiven of all of our iniquity before God as a follower of Jesus. And because we've been forgiven, then we are headed to our home. Been in captivity here, but one day we're going to go home. When Moravian missionaries went to Alaska to take the gospel there, when they learned the Eskimo language, they learned that there was no word in Eskimo for forgiveness. So they had to put a word together. They had to make a word. And what they did was they used several, comp uh, several words and made a compound word so that the... Eskimos could understand the concept of forgiveness, God's forgiveness. It's um, a long word. It's got 25 letters in it. It's still the longest word in the Eskimo language. And here's what it literally means. God's forgiveness means not being able, in Eskimo, not being able to think about it anymore. you get the concept? Forgiveness of all of your sins means that God chooses to not think about your sin anymore. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Psalm 103 verse 12 tells us that in his mind he has put away from him our sins as far as the east is from the west. And he chooses not to think about our sin anymore. Hallelujah. We've been forgiven. Our sins washed away. Not in part, but the whole past, present, and future. And because of that, we're heading home. Now, that has to mean that if we're heading home to heaven, then this world is not our home, is it? We're supposed to do what good we can do here as we make our way home, but don't hunker down too much here because <laughs> this world is not home. Therefore, if disappointment comes along, don't be too disappointed because the disappointment will simply be temporary. Right? Yes. 
indeed temporary. I remember how I felt after I got saved. Do you remember that? How good it was. Oh, how good it was. I was 17. We lived in San Antonio, Texas. I, I didn't understand a whole lot of what I was doing. My mom, my dad, and my sister uh, were not at the house. I was by myself. I wanted to be saved. I wanted to be saved for some time. I had it confused in my mind. I thought that you had to go forward to get saved. That was how you got your ticket punched. On a Saturday afternoon, and I was real shy. I wasn't about to do that. On a Saturday afternoon, I just got down by the couch in our living room and I asked the Lord to save me and I said to him Lord I'll even go down that dumb aisle Sunday if you'll save me well I still didn't understand but the next day was Sunday they got to just as on just as I am and I took off and I went forward and I remember riding in the car back home after church Sunday and just thinking to myself huh, I've been forgiven I'm saved I'm going to heaven when I die I just can't tell you how I felt it was glorious it was wonderful Hallelujah. And I didn't say hallelujah. I was real shy, introverted, so I didn't say anything. But all of these thoughts were going through my mind. I just felt great. You too, if you've been saved, you understand what I'm talking about. But then something happened. Life clobbered me. <laughs> Right? That's what happens. Life clobbers us. We get saved. We're up here on the mountain. And then temptation comes along. We give in. Fear, failure, uncertainty, doubt, anxiety. We go up and down and up and down and up and down in the Christian life. Sometimes we're up here. Sometimes we're dragging bottom. That's what happens. What do you do about it when you're dragging bottom? What do you do about it when you're not experiencing the presence and the pleasure and the power of the Lord in your life that you once experienced when you got saved? Well, our text is going to help us with that too. It's the third assurance. God will restore us to the joy of our salvation when we repent. Now, notice, if you will, something happened between verse 3 and verse 4. Something happened. Notice he's saying, verse 3, Lord, you set aside all your wrath and turn from your fierce anger. So things were good there. But then something must have happened, and I guess that something is called sin because in verse 4 he says, Now, Lord, restore us again. Put away your displeasure. Don't be angry with us forever. Verse 6, will you revive us again? Verse 7, show us your unfailing love. That word unfailing love is that classic Hebrew word hesed, which is God means God's covenantal love that is demonstrated to his people. We experience the presence and the power and the pleasure of the Lord. And so what the psalmist is saying, something's happened. There's not the joy. I'm not experiencing God is basically what he's saying. Lord, won't you revive us again? How does a person get revived who's not experiencing the Lord? Well, sin is what causes us to not experience the presence and the power and the pleasure of the Lord. So how do you deal with that? Here's how. It's called repentance. 
Don't be afraid of that word. Christians ought to be continually repenting. It's not something that happens once in salvation. It's something that continues to happen. Again, don't be afraid of the word. It just means you're going this direction and you recognize, oh, that's the wrong way. And you turn around and go back this way. You realize that you've been chasing something other than Jesus for life. And you come to yourself and you turn around and you come back to God. Malachi 3, 7 says, return to me. God says, return to me and I'll return to you. You want to experience the Lord in your life? Return to your Lord. Life happens. Heavens, can we just be that honest with each other? Life happens. The world, the flesh, and the devil come at us hard, hard, hard. And sometimes, maybe more times than we'd like to admit, they get to us and we give in and we sin or we chase something for life other than the Lord Jesus. Repentance is just saying, ah, and coming to yourself and saying, look, I'm made for Jesus, saved for Jesus. Life can only be found in a relationship with Jesus. And I'm coming home to Jesus. Jesus put it this way. Listen to it. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. You're very familiar with the verse. Come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened. The King James is heavy laden. And what's Jesus' promise? And I will give you, try to say it even through the mass, rest. Bless your heart. That's it. Thank you for playing. Yeah, he'll give you that rest that your soul longs for. Christian, you've been chasing the wind. Isn't that an interesting analogy? You ever try to chase the wind? Can't catch it, can you? Have you dug, like in the words of Jeremiah, have you dug cisterns, wells that will not hold water? Trying to find life in something that this world system will give you. No. Come to yourself and come home. I almost ran away from home one time. I think I was five living in Tuscaloosa. Dad was in Spain with the Air Force. I, don't, I do not remember what happened. I just don't. But, but somehow or another, I guess I got mad at Mom, and I just announced, I'm going to run away. I went back in my bedroom, and I had a little suitcase. So I opened the suitcase up and began to put clothes in it, put my teddy bear, Billy Bean, <laughs> in it too and then that, now you think about this what kind of mother would say something like this my mom came into the room and here's what she said to me I expected her to plead with me not to leave you know what she said can I help you pack <laughs> now you now see I'm still struggling with that you see <laughs> and then she said well, can I fix you something to eat that you can take with you? And I said, Mom, I'm sorry. I don't want to go. <laughs> and I'll do that. Listen, child of God, we don't really want to leave Jesus. But we do, right? We do. Again and again and again. We know that in him is life and life abundant. We know that. We've experienced that. But the world, the flesh, and the devil, our enemies will come along and pull us away from home. If you've been pulled away, I know you want to come home. Come on home to Jesus this morning. Come on home to Jesus this morning. What do I have to do, Jim? Let me remind you again. You don't have to jump any hoops. 
you just come to yourself. You recognize that you're going in the wrong direction. You're living for the things of this world instead of for Jesus, in whom is life now and life eternal. And you turn to him. I've been foolish, Lord. I'm coming home. Fourth assurance. It's found in verses 8 through 14. Uh, God revives personally, but also there's a linkage between God's people and the prosperity of the land in which they live. Look, if you will, at verse 8. It talks about one of the blessings of personal revival is the peace that you've been missing because you've been chasing something other than Jesus. And then if you'll notice in verse 10, it says, Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness, verse 11, springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. All of that is talking about experiencing God. Oh, folks, the greatest blessing you can have as a believer is to experience the presence of the Lord God Almighty with you. Better than rubies and diamonds and stocks and bonds is the presence of the Lord. And you'll experience Him. You'll have personal revival if you'll repent and come back to Him. But notice the connection in our text also. There's this assurance. There is this connection between the way the people of God behave and the land in which they live. Look at verse 1. See the connection there? You showed favor to your land. How did favor come to the land? Well, God restored the fortunes of Jacob. The land was blessed because God blessed his people. Look, if you will, at verse 10. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Oh, I'm sorry, it's verse 9 that says it. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell where? In our land. Then look at verse um, 12. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. It's easy to follow, isn't it? You see, when an individual Christian repents, comes back home, then God blesses if God's people corporately repent. What happens in the land in which those people who are God's people dwell, who have repented, the blessings come on that land. You see this real clearly in 2 Chronicles 7:14. Remember the famous passage, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and will heal their land. See that connection? There is a connection between the way God's people in a land live and the blessings or prosperity of that land. It seems painfully obvious with all of the troublesome things in our land that we need to be praying for God's people to come back to Jesus. Amen? We need to pray that God would stir in the hearts of his people a desire to come back home to him.
That's the solution to the trouble in our land. The Republicans don't have the answer. The Democrats don't have the answer. You know that we Christians have tried to play the political games and leverage our clout to get such and such person elected, and that's not really helped much, has it? Look at the chaos in the land. What's the need? The need is for God's people to be revived. We need to pray that God would bring his people to repentance corporately. Corporately. Now, it starts individually, but we need to pray that God corporately would bring his people back to himself. The Welch revival took place about a little over 100 years ago now. And when the revival took place, it affected all of the country of Wales. And here are some of the positive things that took place. Bars closed. Many, many bars, saloons went out of business. Because folks got saved, got right with Jesus, stopped drinking alcohol. Bars closed. Another thing that happened. Jails closed. Policemen had to go find other lines of work because crime went way down because people got saved and God's people got right with Jesus and crime went down. Here's one of the humorous things that took place. Uh, as a result of the... Uh, the revival that swept there, um, folks got saved, got right with the Lord, and their language changed. The mules in the mines, in the coal mines, had a real hard time understanding what they were supposed to do because the miners' language had totally changed. They'd been used to being cussed out. Now they weren't being cussed out, and they didn't know whether to go left or go right. When God's people are revived, blessings come to the land in which those people live. Let's pray that God would revive his church in America. That's really the need in our day and time. Beverly and I, during these uh, days where we have uh, been asked to stay in a lot, um, we've sort of obeyed. Not been real good at that, but sort of obeyed. One of the things that help us obey and stay inside is we bought several jigsaw puzzles at thrift stores. You could get them for 50 cents or a dollar. And so uh, it didn't matter to us that two or three pieces were missing. <laughs> But anyway, we'd, we'd dump the, and we'd been using, trying to do thousand-piece jigsaw puzzles. We'd dump them out on the table, and it's just all a mess. And then you begin turning the pieces over, and it's still all a mess. Where do you begin? Well, you begin by putting the sides together. And then you begin by finding pieces that have the same kind of color or design and you begin putting those together. And then little bit by little bit, you're able to put the puzzle together. These are puzzling times in which we live. I hope these assurances have helped you during these troubled times. Let me remind you of them. Remember God's for us. His focus is on us. Whatever happens, and nobody knows what's going to happen, whatever happens, he'll never leave us or forsake us, and his grace will be sufficient. The call on us is to personal revival. We can't pray for God to revive his church across this land if we're not living like he wants us to. So the cry or, or the need is for personal revival. And then thirdly, let's pray together that God would bring revival to his church in this country. 
that we be drawn back to Jesus as the passion of our life and that we see him again return his blessings to this land. Would you pray with me? Thank you so much for your attention this morning. Thank you so much. I trust now that the Lord has spoken to your heart. We want to move to our time of just having a word of prayer. But I just feel a need just to be quiet for a moment. So think about what the Lord has said to you. What has the Lord said to you? Maybe you need the assurance that no matter what's going to happen, you don't have to be afraid. He's going to be right there with you. There are those who would want to frighten you. You don't have to be afraid. The Lord will never leave you or forsake you if you're His child. And He will give you the grace to face whatever comes your way. Maybe you're here this morning and the truth of the matter is outwardly you've been pretending that Jesus is the passion of your life but he's really not been. Why don't you turn and embrace him? Just tell him, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been chasing this or that or the other. I've let family or church or business or stocks get in the way. I'm back home, Lord. I'm back home. Give me your presence and your power and your pleasure. May I experience you. And then let's pray together now for our land. Lord, we are your people. And I just believe I speak for everyone here in this auditorium this morning. We're your people. And Lord, we love this land called the United States of America. You have richly blessed this land, but something's gone drastically wrong. Lord, we understand that the key to blessedness in this land are your people. So, Lord, I would ask that you would work. Would you revive your people again? God. Do that glorious work. Cause your people to hunger and thirst for you and you alone. Now we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing a closing hymn, and then I'll have a benediction. We're going to sing the bond of the love. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined a spirit with the spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love. Let us sing now every one. Let us feel his love. Let's pray together. Father, I do thank you for every person that's here today, your people. Lord, I pray that you would give the gift of your presence in a powerful way to them throughout the rest of this day. Dismiss us by your grace. Watch over us. Protect us. Uh, take us safely home. Give us a great week. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.